Welcome to Plymouth 400 Conversations. I'm Michelle Pecoraro, and I will be your host for this series. The 400th commemoration of our nation has inspired a body of creative work, poetry, film, literature, and art. This series will explore several of these projects and how they contribute to the historic, educational, and cultural legacies of the Plymouth 400 commemoration. In this episode, we highlight two books and a work of art. We will begin with the authors of In the Wake of the Mayflower, which is a logical progression from a very detailed painting, the work of Cape Cod author and artist Karen Rinaldo and author and lecturer Kevin Doyle. Karen and Kevin, welcome to Plymouth 400 Conversations. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's a pleasure Thanks for to be here. Thank you to the 400 group. Thank you. So let me start with this. This book uh, has combined your joint love of art and history. Would you tell us how the In the Wake of the Mayflower came to be? Now, Kevin and I have had this conversation uh, about the inspiration behind the book, and we feel it really might not have ever happened had it not been for the commissioning of the first Thanksgiving painting back in 1994. So this was a commission that came from the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches, the NACCC, and it was uh, that commission then that really was the, um, the basis for the book. That and the 400th commemoration of Mayflower landing on, on Cape Cod shores. Very good. Well, Karen, I have a, I'm going to direct this one to you. You have included the artwork completed by you for the first Thanksgiving uh, in this depiction. You have been most sensitive and inclusive. Uh, would you tell us about the research that it required to depict the illustration that you did in the painting accurately? So uh, one of the um, criteria for the painting that was really emphasized uh, with the NACCC was that the painting be historically accurate. This was their gift to the nation. Um, it was it went through about four seasons of uh, research and then painting as well. In order to tell a story, to convey a time and a, a moment in history that was so important, uh, you have to really delve into the historical accuracy. And you know there are no eyewitnesses to an event like this. And so we rely heavily on the journals that are left behind conversations that you have with historians. And my work, my research was um, centered around Pl Pilgrim Hall and Plymouth Plantation, uh, their archives, libraries, um, talking and um, spending a lot of time with the uh, director there who was with the indigenous uh, group of people. And that was uh, Tony Pollard, went by his tribal name of Nanak Pashamit. And he was very helpful in, in explaining and describing how the natives would have looked, uh, their appearance, what they were wearing, the temperament, uh, their disposition. And, and all of that was built into then the composition. So you have uh, journals that are left behind, descriptions of um, the attitude of these people, the pilgrims, um, and piece by piece, rather like a jigsaw puzzle, you start to piece together the, uh, the time and just what was taking place. So uh, complicated, daunting, uh, but very exciting. And I took on a real responsibility to create that historical accuracy and an empathy for the, uh, the natives and uh, a sympathetic feeling for what the natives had gone through. And, and for the pilgrims and, and their journey across um, uh, a, tough, a tough encounter on the seas and, and not knowing what they would encounter here. So um, a lot of research and, uh, yeah, uh, sensitivity to the time, for sure. And, you know, I might just add, if I may, uh, Michelle, Karen doesn't always get into this, but the NACCC, the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches, 
calls themselves the Pilgrim's Church. Uh, they've been, they associate directly with the Pilgrims. And a hundred years ago, for the 300th, uh, the same organization commissioned a, a silversmith in Holland to create a vast relief of the Reverend Robinson, who was the pastor, if you will, of the, uh, of the Pilgrims. And a hundred years later, they commissioned Karen to do this piece for the United States as a gift to the nation. Yeah, and he That's was remarkable. the spiritual advisor. Um, there isn't time to go into it, but I, I feel that he really had a hand in inspiring um, the pilgrims in uh, creating the contact, the Mayflower contact, and probably carrying over to the treaty. Wow, that, that's a lot of, um, of background and research that you did. Kevin, um, I, this one's for you. The historical document of the six-point treaty between Bradford and Massasoit is remarkable. Would you talk about the agreement and its genesis um, and its antecedents? Certainly glad to, because it really was a marvelous piece of, uh, of literature that's been passed down to us. Uh, and it, it was March 22nd, 1621, which was three months after the Pilgrims landed. That was the very first time that Chief Massasoit showed up uh, at, the, at the plantation. Uh, he came obviously in the, uh, uh, in the company of Squanto, who was an English speaker uh, for, uh, for, after having been kidnapped and then, and then got himself back to Plymouth. Uh, and so that was how they were able to communicate. This was the first meeting then between Governor Bradford and Chief, uh, uh, Chief Massasoit. Just very quickly, a couple of the points in it, for example, was if any did war against him, then we would aid him. If any did, if did war against us, then he would aid us. And the next point was tell your Confederate friends the same thing. Uh, that was the type of thing. Chief Flying Eagle, who some people may know as uh, Earl Mills Sr., uh, said that the, the, uh, the treaty really was sort of a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And you might ask yourself, was this through trust or through, or through need? But, you know, I think that it, it, it combines a little bit of each. Uh, as Karen mentioned, we already had the Mayflower Compact, which set the relationship within the, within the community itself. This treaty went uh, now extended between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag tribes surrounding them. Quite a bit different from what happened in the Lost Colony, for example, up in Albemarle Sound, North Carolina. They were wiped out. The only thing left of that is the word Croatan. Down in Jamestown, they were all but wiped out. Uh, Powhatan had no use for the, uh, for the group whatsoever. But here they were allowed to be in existence for three months. Uh, you know that they were under observation. But three months later, Massasoit came along, and in these six sentences, they created a document that lasted basically for 50 years. In many ways, they were fortunate in that Bradford and Massasoit both lived into their 80s. So they were on for 40 years after this document was signed, but it lasted right up until King Philip's War in 1675. I think at the core of the treaty too, was the respect and honor. Yes, yeah, I, I think that was a piece part of the uh, of the, the Pilgrim Code, if you will, mm -hmm. that was originally expressed in the Mayfall Compact. And that was such an unusual um, treaty as well at the time. So, um, so uh, you have mentioned that uh, Cape Cod has been successful in protecting the, this is a quote, the history, tradition, and culture of the Native population. Historically, some conflicts about land and land uh, use and ownership have, have come up for generations. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and um, how the groups kind of existed within that? Sure, glad to. And, and right off the bat, I'll say the credit goes to the tribe. Uh, yes, they, they, uh, the history, traditions, and culture have been pretty well preserved. Uh, in the Cape community, but really uh, the Wampanoags deserve a lot of credit for their persistence and resilience uh, and the pride that they have in their accomplishments and in the tribe. Uh, the Wampanoags, of course, have been here since ever. Uh, in fact, there's a sign that as you enter into Mashpee that says, uh, Land of the Wampanoag Incorporated in 1850. 
And I think underneath it, it should say land of the Wampanoag since forever. Uh, and, and that certainly uh, ties in how they were since, since the glacier, uh, the Wampanoags have, have inhabited Cape Cod. When you say that it's been off and on, yeah, every, every 20 to 100 years, somebody questions it. I do have a timeline here. Uh, it was, Nashville was established in 1658 uh, as a reserve for the Wampanoag. Uh, and then in 1665, it became a praying town and so it was authorized. Then as you go through 90 years later, England said, no, we're gonna take control of it. 23 years later, the, the king said, no, we're gonna give it back to the Indians uh, and, and so forth, back and forth, right up and through 2017. And under the Obama administration, the, tr the tribe was uh, recognized uh, for the final time, although it's being challenged again and they will prevail. There's not a question mm -hmm. in my mind. But 60 years ago, Mashpee was a, uh, a, a town of 13, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, 1,300 people six, uh, 60 years ago, mostly all Wampanoags. Today it's 13,000. Uh, and so the Wampanoag population is getting uh, more and more watered down, if you will, by, by uh, people moving in. But in the meantime, we have the annual powwow, we have the old Indian meeting house is still here along with the cemetery. There's a trading post, a newly opened trading post in Mashpee Commons. And you see place names all over Cape Cod, uh, which, which really are signs of respect as well as uh, place names. And, and uh, Equisit, Sipawisit, Asinippi, Man Manomet, Pumaquid, those types of place names are preserved over time. And I think that's a, a great sign of respect. If you go back, the very first time that things started to change was at, in 1645, when people, when 49 residents of the Plymouth Plantation said, hey, this is getting too small for everybody. We're gonna move across to the land that is currently called uh, East Ham. But they called it Nauset, which I thought was a very nice hat tip to the, uh, to the occupants to, to whom, they, from whom they bought it. That purchase included most of the outer arm of the Cape. Now the, the uh, court of Massachusetts, which was then populated by Puritans, not the Pilgrims anymore, but in 1630 when, when other types of uh, English uh, settlers came in, more interested in the natural resources of New England and more interested in commerce back to Mother England. Uh, they came in and after they bought the land, called it Nauset in 1645. Six years later, in comes the, the court and says, no, we're going to call it East Ham, which is nothing more than a suburb of London. And that was really kind of too bad. Uh, but in the meantime, as I say, there's plenty of other place names that do survive on the Cape. And I think it's a real credit to the tribe, with their tribal headquarters here in, uh, uh, in Mashpee, and they're also the, the uh, sub-tribe out in Aquina, uh, who changed their name from Gayhead on Martha's Vineyard back to Aquina. And uh, again, a preservation of their history, tradition, and culture. Right, and those are both uh, federally recognized, both Aquina and Mashpee tribes. And then, there, of course, there's a Herring Pond tribe um, in the Plymouth area, which is a traditional tribe, but not federally recognized. So let's, I just want to make sure that we clear that. So we have about mm -hmm. uh, a minute left. And so, Karen, I'm going to throw this to you, but you can both speak. But you know, we have 60 seconds. So your historical description and, and accuracy in, the, in your montage of the 15 Cape Cod towns is just remarkable. How did you do that research and how did you pare down what must have been a huge amount of research to, um, you know, to be able to write the book? And so you, now you have about a minute. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so this was a project that actually started in uh, 1974. So it was a three year uh, project that I thought would be a nice tribute. It was the nation's 200th its bicentennial and uh, it appears in the back of our, our book we show the 15 Cape Cod towns uh, in a montage style which is taking uh, landmarks and and balancing off a design that showcases a town its personality its history 
Um, and it makes people in each town then very aware of, of what they have. Uh, it makes it a great draw for tourists who come to the town. But, and, and each one is so different. The personalities of the town are uh, really revealed in an interesting way. Um, you have a center focus and you have um, a balancing of uh, all these different landmarks. So um, you may find one that pops up in an antique shop or a, a yard sale from time to time, but they're um, very popular still today. Very much so. So I, I wish we could talk longer, but thank you both so much, Karen and Kevin, for joining us today on Plymouth 400 Conversations. Thank you very much, and we will be right back. Our second guest has been very active in local history and specifically the history of Dux Duxbury, Massachusetts, once called the Northern Parish of Plymouth. Jane Talmadge is the chair of the Duxbury 400 Committee and senior editor for the book Duxbury, Our Pilgrim Story. Thank you, Jane, for being here. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to jump right in here. As the second town incorporated here um, in this area, Duxbury is uniquely positioned to discuss early co colonial history. Would you talk a little bit about Duxbury's part in this? Uh, yes, Duxbury actually sits on the 42nd parallel, which was discovered by the explorer John Smith in the early 1600s. So the pilgrims on the Mayflower knew where they were going. They had maps and they had a direction. Um, they actually landed first on Clark's Island, which is right across the bay from Duxbury in a storm. And uh, local lore is that uh, Miles Standish, who of course was on the shallop with them, uh, was looking across the bay for the future site of his land holdings. And uh, actually Clark's Island sits right across the bay from the now state uh, reservation and the Miles Standish Monument. Um, we actually also, if you look at Duxbury by the numbers, um, we had a third of the Mayflower passengers actually settle in Duxbury. Uh, of 102 that came over, uh, 51 survived the first winter, and uh, somewhere between 15 to 18 of them actually settled in Duxbury. Uh, the three military leaders, of course, uh, uh, sorry, Miles Standers, the military leader, William Bradford, the governor, and Elder Brewster, the spiritual leader, also had land holdings uh, in Duxbury. So it really was a part of the early colonial history of Plymouth Colony. Yes, um, that's the correct. The book itself, right. uh, which is a wonderful uh, compilation, is, a, is an actual... Uh, partnership between several organizations. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about? Yes, of course. Well, we sort of, we have very long-standing traditions in cultural history uh, in Duxbury. Of course, the Duxbury World and Historical Society, which has published many books about the, uh, the Pilgrim era, most notably the Digging Duxbury, which was done in 2012 at the Miles Standish uh, home site and also a book by Henry Fisk, who went around and looked at old cellar holes when he was researching and was a tree warden in the uh, 1924 in Duxbury. So we have a long tradition with the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. We have a long tradition with the Alden House, which is uh, the Alden Kindred of America and the oldest um, continuous land holding in the country um, through, through the Aldens. So the uh, living, live, what I call living cultural history is very, very much a part of our civic duty in Duxbury to keep the pilgrim story alive. And that was sort of the genesis of the book. Uh, we have a couple of macro themes that we wanted our essayists to address. One was um, the relationship to the land and the other was the relationship to agreements. They were very caught up with patents and compacts and agreements and they actually were blown off course and uh, didn't really have uh, the writ of a king to do what they were doing. So they were very concerned about that. And of course, relationship to others and others would include their relationship with the, with the Native Americans and their relationship with the holding company back in London, which was called the uh, Merchant Adventures, who funded their voyage. 
Very good. And a lot of that um, in the introductory essay, uh, there's a very thorough overview of Duxbury's archaeological history. Um, and historic preservation is so important. Uh, and Duxbury has extensive town records that also reflect that. Um, would you talk about the value of the legacy of those documents? Well, that's really a, a very intriguing question because as I get feedback about the book, people are telling me how valuable to them as a reader the endnotes are at each essay. And we were very careful to ask our authors to document primary sources, to document uh, readings of literature through the ages. And um, as I look back on, on what, what we used, we of course used um, primary sources of, of deeds. We used Bradford's book uh, of, of Plymouth Plantation. We used Mort's Relation. And then we also used more contemporary writers about the scene. Um, certainly um, Daniel Webster, his oratory in uh, 1820 for the Plymouth Celebration was cited several times. And then um, the work of uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poet laureate, who wrote The Courtship of Miles Standish. So, and, and my takeaway from all of that is that the documentation of the Pilgrim story has kind of waxed and waned over the centuries. And um, it, it, they were talking about keeping the story alive back in Daniel Webster's day. It's not, the fact that the story is lost is, is not a new thing. Jane, you have included an essay in this book by Paula Peters. It's called uh, A Backstory to Civilization. And it's about the disease experienced by the Wampanoag Nation as well as the cultural assimilation uh, indigenous people experienced at the time. Can you talk about the significance of this uh, essay and information? Uh, yes, of course. When, when the colonists arrived, um, of course, they found, they didn't find people. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. One was at the time of year, because the Native Americans um, would have moved inland after their summer season. And the other was the disease pestilence that um, arrived, primarily looking back to the 1500s when the traders started up in Maine, coming down through Canada and Maine. Um, they brought smallpox, tuberculosis, you know, all kinds of terrible, terrible diseases. So when the, when the Mayflower arrived, they found fields that were cleared, they found corn that was stored, um, and they found several folks, uh, Native American folks, who helped them understand how to be farmers, because of course these folks did not know that. Um, and I think, so that's one perspective, kind of, you know, what did they find when they arrived? The other, I think, has to do with how the colonists, uh, the imperialists, perceived the Native Americans. And um, Paula includes a, a passage from Verrazano, the explorer who was over here in the 1500s. And I'm going to read the passage because I really think it just sort of sums up the, the perspective. Um, this is from Verrazano in 1524. Due to the lack of common language, we were unable to find out signs or gestures, um, how much religious faith these people had. We think they had neither religion nor laws, nor are there temples or churches or prayer among their peoples. We consider they have no religion and that they live in absolute freedom and that everything they do proceeds from ignorance. And Paula goes on to tell us that if they had looked a little harder or looked with a different perspective, they would have found a great deal of Native American spirituality, um, the circle being the example that she gives about how when one is in a circle, you're both in, in, in inclusive as an individual and inclusive as the circle. Um, and if anyone um, would want to go to, to travel to Mashpee for a, a, a wonderful visit to the Wampanoag Museum that explains their culture, explains their relationship to sea, and to whaling, I would heartily encourage you to, to do that little trip. What surprising details were unearthed uh, when, you've been, when you were researching these articles for this publication? Because I know there were su a few surprises. There were surprises throughout the entire book, and one would think, you know, what else is there to tell in the story? And we tasked all of the authors to give us new 
perspective, give us new evidence because we wanted a contemporary perspective on, on the, the oldest story. Um, I'm going to run through some of them because I think they're, they're fascinating and um, I learned a great deal. The first was that we've always been told a lot about the, um, the way in which the colonists amassed their acreage uh, through the family um, as part of the uh, land di uh, divisions that they did. So, you know, the, the, the individual head of household would, would get five acres, 10 acres, depending upon the number of persons in the family. But what I hadn't realized and what I found so interesting is that many of the leaders um, in the colony became sort of assistant governors and they had various tasks to do, uh, land surveying, uh, judicial matters, uh, you know, that type of thing. And, and it was basically, they, they bartered their time, for this particular job that they had to, in exchange for land. So um, John Alden, for example, amassed, uh, I think by the time he passed on 600 acres of land and it was all through these magistrate duties. So that, that was one thing that really I was unaware of, it surprised me. Another is that there are people who were lost to history and there are two in particular who are interesting individuals because what they did set in stone some business activities that were possible. Um, Isaac Allerton was sent back to London in 1626 to negotiate a better deal um, so that they could have rights to do fur trading, which became a very important part of their uh, economic expansion. And he uh, was able to write into one of these agreements, one of these patents, the fact that they would have land, uh, own land on 15, 15 miles either side of the Kennebunk uh, River in Maine. So he, and that, was, that fact is sort of lost to history that that became the fundamental reason they were able to do the trading in Maine. The other fellow was William Collier and he lived in Duxbury. Um, he did not have any descendants through the, um, his sons. He only had daughters. So we kind of lost him a bit because the records are not very good about the women. And what he did, he was the tax man. And basically he set up all the, the agreements and laws and whatever on how they were gonna garner property taxes. And uh, Peggy Baker, our author in this, era, uh, in this particular essay, has done a wonderful job looking at these folks who were lost to history. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have several thank more. You for that. There are many more, I'm sure, but you know, we, can, we want people to, uh, to get the book. So we'll, we'll, yes. let them, we'll let them read that in the book. But in our last, say, 30 seconds or so, um, you know, in addition to the work uh, along ancient paths, uh, what other historical projects were your legacy projects that, you know, has Duxbury 2020 facilitated in response to the com uh, commemoration? We call them our signature projects, and we've been at this now for four or five years. And we started with an archaeological dig of the Sampson property along Duxborough Path, which was funded by the Sampson Kindred. Um, and then we went along and opened up Green Harbor's Path, which was the first engineered highway in the colony starting in 1623. And it was back in the woods and no one particularly knew where it was. So one of our uh, board members, Kathy Cross, assembled a group of the Appalachian Mountain Club and the town conservation department, um, the Boy Scouts, uh, private donations, First Parish Church, and created a new trailhead and the ability to go back into those woods and understand the story and walk walk the path. So you uh, could that other feel like did. you were walking in the footsteps of, of people's ancestors. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And of course, all the things that, that Desiree has done at the Alden House to basically yes. bring forward the Alden story, and we have new exhibits, and we have outside activities which has yeah. enabled us to be open through, through the virus. Well, Jane, I could talk to you all day. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Plymouth 400 Conversations. For more information about these books and how to view past episodes, please visit our website, plymouth400inc.org. Until next time, go make some history. <laughs>